Well, it's a great pleasure to be with you this morning. Uh, I probably would, should start with a little story. It's a story about a preacher, a southern preacher, filled with fire and brimstone, walks into his church and decides to give a sermon on the end of days. And he says to the members of the church, ladies and gentlemen, at the end of days, there will be wailing and crying and the gnashing of teeth. Members of the church listen very attentively. He says, let me assure you, there will be wailing and crying and the gnashing of teeth. One of the parishioners stands up at this point and says to the preacher, but preacher, I don't have any teeth. <laughs> the preacher looks at him and says, well, at the end of days, teeth will be provided. Uh, let me assure you that we're here to provide teeth. Uh, arguments that will make some sense. Arguments in defense of positions that many of you hold and many of you don't hold. Uh, we have a very distinguished panel, but before I go through an introduction of the panel, I sent them some questions, and I'd like to address the questions that I sent them so that you get an idea of what we will be discussing. The first, of course, is the whole question of has technology itself altered the pedagogical approach? That is, is the instructor what I would describe as the sage on the stage, or the guide on the side, or the peer in the rear? Has the computer changed the nature of the, the kind of pe pedagogy that we are living with? Has the university itself adapted to technology? If so, how? Is the university in cyberspace the wave of the future? And if not, why? And of course, Dick is going to tell us about why it is the wave of the future. Surely, if you are, if you are considering the, uh, the nature of the university today, and you wanted to start a university de novo, would you put up the bricks and mortar that are associated with universities? Or would you create a university in cyberspace? Is technology more than an alternative process for learning? Have we tapped the potential of computerization, or is the discussion of this topic fraught with all kinds of overblown expectations? Why haven't electric colleges caught on? Is there a cultural barrier to learning on a computer as opposed to a classroom? Stanford University, NYU tried universities of the air, and they were not successful. The Open University, British Open University, in some respects, has given up on the idea of completely trying to use computers as a way of teaching. And when I chatted with Asa Briggs, who was the former chancellor of the Open University, he said to me, there are cultural barriers that stand in the way of relying heavily on the computer. Is that true? Is the professor reading from legal pa pad notes an anachronism? Or is the quality of his remarks what counts? I remember not so long ago meeting with Larry Ellison, who was addressing a group of professors, not unlike this organization, and he said, ladies and gentlemen, I think professors are underpaid. Each one of you should get a million dollars a year. There was a lot of applause and great excitement at that point. And then he said, but let me assure you, I don't need more than a hundred of you. <laughs> and what he was getting at is that he could put Milton Friedman on air, and therefore you don't need all of the economics professors in the United States. And one Milton Friedman might be sufficient to teach all students economics. Well, is that true? Is that the way in which we want to proceed? Can one deny the importance of computerization in the university's future? And here again, one has to examine this question in the light of the kind of economic changes that are occurring in the United States at the moment. Now, we have three very distinguished people to discuss these ideas. As I said, I've already sent these questions to them. Uh, the first is uh, Andrew Gillen. Andrew is substituting for Professor Vetter. He is the research director of the Center for College of Affordability and Productivity in the D.C. office of Ohio University. He has, uh, he has authored several pieces for the center, including the, uh, the a tu a tuition bubble, a lesson from the housing bubble, and recently graduated from Florida State University with a Ph.D. in economics. The, uh, the second of the panelists I've known for some time, Dick Persergian, has been relentless in pursuing the idea of a university in cyberspace, and that is Yorktown University, and certainly has worked very hard to make this happen. I remember having coffee with him roughly 10 years ago when we first discussed this idea, and it was nothing more than an idea, and Dick has made it a reality, quite an extraordinary achievement. And then the third is Scott, J Scott Jasek, who is, of course, the editor of Inside Higher Education, and many of you will remember he was also at one point the editor of the Chronicle of Higher Education, I think for about five years. So it's, we're going to start with uh, each of them speaking for ten minutes. I'm going to be uh, quite, uh, quite precise about that ten-minute time span, and then we'll move on and uh, engage you in questions and answers as well. We're going to start with Andrew. Andrew, please. The floor is yours. Ten minutes, please. 